Hey y'all, it's Tim, the co-host of the Trailer Park Podcast. On this show, we bring you podcast trailers so that you can discover your next favorite show. Or if you're a creator, we want to help you get your show into the ears of your ideal listener. We are still in between seasons, and Ariel and I have been working hard on bringing you some bonus content. This time around, we are sharing something a little different. A deep dive interview with Grant Hill, the creator of Serum, one of the trailers we featured in season one. Serum is a narrative podcast, and narrative pods are typically scripted and meticulously put together and take a long time to produce. But I've always found them mysterious and a little out of reach for the DIY podcaster. Grant and I discuss the misconceptions and lessons learned of creating narrative podcasts and some tips on how to start this journey into narrative. Before we go any further, let's make sure we're all on the same page. If you missed it, during season one of TPP, we featured the trailer for Serum. Take a second to go listen to that if you haven't already. If you have, awesome. Here's a refresher for everyone. Reporter Grant Hill stumbles into a cab after a long night out. A conversation with the driver leads to a startling revelation. The driver claims to be a Hollywood insider who helped the doctor develop a potential cure for AIDS in the 90s. His Hollywood claims turn out to be true. But what about this cure for AIDS? A search turns up a black physician named Gary Davis from Tulsa, Oklahoma, who had a big dream to use goat antibodies to develop a serum that would free the world from HIV and AIDS. What happened to the dream? And why did so many fear for the doctor's life? I was absolutely gripped by the trailer. So without further ado, here's my interview with Grant Hill. Grant Hill, welcome to the Trailer Park Podcast. Thanks so much for having me on. I appreciate it. So I was introduced to Serum because we selected your trailer as one of the ones we featured on trailer park and it's just a testament to what trailers can do to pique someone's interest i personally am invested in learning about narrative podcasts it's one of my favorite genres of podcasts but i think there might be some misconceptions about what they are and what it takes to create them so from your perspective what do you think is a common misconception about narrative podcasts? In my experience, we were able to do serum with less resources than one might expect. And I think what I really like about narrative podcasts is probably one of its biggest misconceptions, with, which, which is that like it takes a lot of money to produce. I mean... I mean, it does and it should. I mean, you could do a lot more with more money. You know what I mean? But I think we were able to make Serum with, I used the same recorder, the same microphone, like everywhere I went, because that's all I had at that time. So it definitely would have been easier with more resources. But I think being really resourceful and using what you have is, is infinitely more valuable than like the best mic. <laughs> I will say if I had more resources, it would have been able to travel more. Like a lot of that stuff I had to do on my own at first before this became like a a bigger production. So it certainly can cost a lot, you know, depending on the equipment, depending on the travel. And then just the, the hours, like the work hours it takes to put it together. But with making serum, it sounds like what you're saying is it didn't, cost as much as you would think i got into podcasting i think because video to me seemed so there seemed so many barriers to entry when it came to video and with podcasting it's just it's fundamentally at the start at least it's you with a microphone from there yeah i mean bringing in really talented people to help you edit it you know to help you mix it really nicely to put it all together that does take money and that takes resources But what I mean is the barrier to entry to do this initially is relatively low. Obviously, you need the time and you need to have, you know, 
some equipment and some kind of access to those bare minimums. But I think anyone who has found a really good story and has the kind of the the time to dig into it could essentially make one of these things, which is what I love about the medium and what I love about narrative podcasts is that it's such a good launching off point to tell stories that maybe, you know, would be a great movie or something, but you just wouldn't even know how to approach that, if, especially if you're not like within that industry. And I think that's just, that's just really is what captures my imagination about podcasts. It's because it's like anything is possible. Cause all I need really is my microphone, my computer, and like a plane ticket. <laughs> now that, that's where, that's where the money comes <laughs> right, in. But, exactly, uh, yeah. exactly. Now, now were you trained specifically in narrative podcasts or did, because like, I've never taken a podcasting class in my life. I just did it, you know? So what about you? Like, how did you get into this podcasting in general? Sure. So in, in undergrad, I studied journalism. I majored in journalism, but I, at the time they didn't have a podcasting class, but what happened was actually my, the, ch- the chief of police for my hometown, my small hometown in New-, in New Jersey, he became the first American police officer in over a decade to be charged with a hate crime. And so that was right before my last year of undergrad. And I was really, it was, it was out of nowhere for me. I think others in the community weren't surprised at all. But for me, it was like, wow, this, this is so random. And I started digging into the story a little bit, what like local news coverage. And, you know, at the same time, this is when papers, as they still are, you know, they were paring back on, on, lo- on local news coverage, on, they were laying off reporters. So I just wanted to know more about this. And as I, as I started to learn more about it, I was like, hmm, this might be a good podcast. And I, I never made one before, but I did have experience with music, working with dolls and everything like that. So I thought it was something that I could at least have the technical ability to start. I don't, I didn't know about finish at that point. <laughs> and I still don't know about finish. <laughs> it takes a lot of help for me. <laughs> but that was kind of my first four. So I ended up spending like eight months or so with a terrible recorder, with a microphone in my dorm room and creating this five-part pop investigative podcast just all about the case. I was truly like whatever less than a cub reporter was, like, (laughs) you know, just with a microphone and a dream trying to tell this story. But, and like going back now, I I cringe at how it sounds now, but, you know, I was was really proud of it at the time. It felt like the first time I did something within journalism that I was like really, really proud of. And then from there, you know, I I started working. I did a couple internships in podcasting because I just loved I loved the, um, I loved the form. I loved the medium. And, and then when this story came up, I was like, oh my God, well, here it is. I gotta, you know, really juice this one for all it's worth. So from the first idea or even conception of serum, and I would assume that would be when you met your friend in the cab or the Mm -hmm. Uber, whatever it was from that point to when it was finally launched in September of 2022. Like how long was that process? So we were still kind of really in the thick of, as I'm sure anybody who's made, made this kind of stuff before, like you're in the thick of it until it's over. Mm -hmm. Uh, We were very much working on the last episode until the day before the last episode launched, if I remember correctly. So that process was a little over three years from the moment I got in the cab until when the last episode was released. Wow. When you were publishing the episodes and i think there was like seven right there were nine 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 okay so and you publish them every week yes yep so this is something i've always wondered about a series because let's say you have episode one you know it's ready you're you're gonna launch it do you have all of the other episodes already done and then you tweak it as you go along as like the weeks or there's probably not a like a rule to that but how how did that work out for you i worked really closely with with mike and scott who's the host of 
the pulse for WHYY, and she really shepherded me through this whole process. So she was doing an entire other show while she while we were putting this together, which how she did that, I have no idea. I, I, I do not understand it. I still don't understand it. But so we were both kind of doing this wasn't like our full time thing. We were kind of it was mine, but I, I had no idea what I was doing. So she, it was much more of a burden for her. But so she, while she was working on that show, we were actively still writing and producing to get these episodes together. I mean, it was crazy. It was absurd. <laughs> we had the first half of the season. We knew and we had that basically recorded and pre-produced and then we would tweak it as we got closer. So the first four to five episodes we had pretty much in the can, we just needed to make some tweaks. And then once the first episode was produced, I think we were working on, or once that the first episode was released, we were still working on six through nine. And then, so that just became this strange process of tweaking before the, the week before the release, while also working on scripts and fact checking and, and, and working what, seeing what we're going to need to produce the next or the last three episodes. So we were under the gun almost every week. It, it felt like a sprint at the same time, a marathon. So it was very bizarre. I don't think this is normally how it goes, but th this is, it was in that, that true eth and serum could have been produced no other way because it was like me, literally me with my microphone doing two jobs at once and it was held together with like glue and duct tape <laughs> and then at the end it just like, came out and and you know we were proud of it but we were like i don't know how we were able to do this it was a miracle that we were able to do it <laughs> yeah so it sounds like you have this plan where you're sketching out episodes you're writing the script you're tweaking and producing and then as you go along you're like oh well you know, we really need to do something about, you know, what's going to happen in episode eight or episode nine. And then it, it's you and your producers kind of just working together to, to make it all happen. Is that right? Yeah, exactly. And I think one of the most interesting things that, that, you know, or issues that we had to deal with was opening loops in the first episode. We were like, oh, we'll close that in later episodes. And it's, now you have this, you're writing out this structure for, you know, an episode seven or eight. And you're like, where do I close that? Like, I got to close the loop. How do I close it? Where do I close it? And so that was that kind of problem solving, I think was, was one of the most challenging things for us. But miraculously, I think we were able to find ways in each to close each loop. And hopefully, it, hopefully it felt like that. Yeah. You know? Two questions. Do you think you could have done this? By yourself absolutely not no yeah i mean i no no way i i think the reporting the reporting was mostly me but i submitted a the we sat down for an edit it was me mike and two other producer uh, reporters for the pulse for the first episode and man my intro was just it was it i, I thought about it way too much you know that's it's the first it's the intro to the whole series yeah. so you like have all this time to over intellectualize everything and i got in there and they were just like what what the hell is this and, and, I was, and i was like no this is how it needs to be and and i just thank my lucky stars that everybody was in that room to say you've got to you've got to change your outlook on this uh, and you've got to change you know how you're writing this what you're thinking about because it's it just it just wasn't working without mike in and without without the help from our engineer, Charlie, and the two reporters that, that helped edit this, this would never have, have taken shape. It's such a pleasure to speak with you because I consume a lot of narrative podcasts and I've always wanted to be able to talk with someone who produced one and ask these questions. So this is not only helpful for me, but for our listeners. So let's talk about tools and specifically equipment. You said that you were using pretty much the same kind of recorder throughout the whole series. So what are you using? I'm using a Zoom H6. And uh, I don't know what this mic is even oh, called. So you I'm had not, the shotgun not... mic on the H6. Well, at times I did. I bought that shotgun for my trip to Tulsa. I was like, I'm going to need something that's going to be able to withstand 
the wind. I actually don't think I, I actually didn't have the shotgun mic for, for Tulsa. I okay. had uh, whatever the stereo, you know, mic that it comes with. Right. It. So at times I would use that. And then at times I would use this uh, Audio Technica. I don't, I don't even know what a uh, condenser mic. Oh, essentially. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then I, I prefer the Audio Technica. And I just hold it using my hand because that's all I, I don't have a fancy microphone holder. And, and it seems to do the job. I mean, sometimes you would hear like my, like rustling of my hand moving or whatever, but, and I, and at times like it was very windy, which I loathed when I heard it back, <laughs> but, but yeah, I mean, I'm not like a gearhead type of guy. So I, I probably could have got so much better sound had I consulted someone before all this, <laughs> but <laughs> for me, I'm, I'm just more like, Hey, I got this equipment. I'm going to make the most of it. And I think it, it worked out. And I feel this way with. I have a pet peeve with, with tape syncs, like when people use tape syncs for in, in audio, in narrative podcasts, when the, the host is on like a call with a source or whatever, it should sound like a phone call in, in, uh, in my mind. Yeah. Because I, I, it just breaks, it breaks the wall of you're, but you're not really there with him. It, for me, that takes me out of the thing. If something doesn't sound as, as good as it could. I, I tend to be a little more forgiving of that because I don't know, I think it shows you a little bit about the show and who's making it and what, what resources they have. And it brings you more into that story. So maybe that's just how I justify the bad sound to myself. So I don't know. (laughs) I I think there's an argument to be made either way, you know, uh, but I like, I like that justification. (laughs) (laughs) Thanks. I appreciate that. That's what I'm going with. (laughs) All right. So what about. You know, we at the beginning or, you know, we talked about a, a misconception that narrative podcasts cost a lot of money, but it does cost money. So what were your major funding sources? Yeah. So originally for the first year and a half, I didn't have any. So I was just paying for this out of my pocket. It was the pandemic. So mm-hmm. I didn't really, I had a lot of time on my hands. Obviously, at first I didn't have anything. And then when I, when I went to Tulsa, that's when Mike and reached out and was like, Hey, we could, we could probably get a grant for something like this. So I was able to secure a grant from WHYY. That was a modest, very modest grant, I think, which I don't uh, have a problem with. I'm an unproven person with the crazy AIDS cure story. So, you know, I, I I understand, (laughs) but but that helped a lot. That helped for travel. And I mostly spent it on travel. Yeah. So, I mean, I haven't made any money from this. And I think what's more remarkable is the fact that Mike in and, and Charlie at HYY, Charlie is our engineer, they both did the second job during the time when they were doing their normal job. And then so when I say it doesn't cost a lot of money, I mean, personally, I was able to do this with that small, that modest grant that just paid for travel, but I didn't pay myself and they weren't being paid, you know, as far as I know, more than what their, you know, everyday salary is. So that costs money and it should cost money to pay people for doing this type of work. I don't mean to say like people shouldn't get paid. I just mean to say you can still create a product with a small travel budget that I think can, that can carry a story through nine episodes. And and you got to have people believe in what you're doing, but yeah, if you just counted up all the hours that you put in and you know, anyone that that helped you and paid their quote unquote wage, it would cost a lot. As it should, it's, it's hard work, but I, I just think this was a story that just kind of captured our imagination and, and we, it's something that we felt like we had to work on, you know, whether <laughs> at least I felt I had to work on whether I was getting paid or not. So maybe that was a terrible career move. Then <laughs> from now on, no one will pay me, but you know, I don't know. So what are the things that you would have done differently or, or maybe some just general lessons learned? Well, although it helps to be under the gun a little bit with timing to get stuff done and to force the creative juices to flow rather than wait for them to come, you know, uh, come flowing. I, I do wish we had less time under the gun. I I wish that there was a little less of a time crunch at the end to, 
you know, while we were tweaking episodes for that for that week, also writing episodes for and that would come out in the next two weeks, which we would have to produce while we tweaked the episodes before that. So it, it just became very chaotic in that way. It would have been nice to to schedule that out a little bit better. But I think that it was like a do or die type thing where we we had to set a date to get it out or else we would have never gotten it. it we, we would have just kept tweaking and kept tweaking. So yeah, it's a little bit of a double, a double-sided thing there. Well, you know, another thing is, so at the end of the series, I'm not going to be able to describe this the way that I want to, but at the end of the series, it, it was like, you know, you're kind of like, oh my gosh, I have more ideas about what is happening here, what is happening with the doctor, what is happening, potential cover up and, and you start like, you get your recorder out and you are just unloading into your recorder about <laughs> all of these different ideas. And that's how you end the series. And I was just like, <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> but I guess that was the point, right? It's like you could just keep on going and keep on going forever uh, yeah. with the different theories and the different rabbit holes that you can go down. Yeah. And it was important for us to feel like there was there were elements of closure throughout the series. Like we did find out more about, you know, the doctor's most famous patient. We got a more fuller story. We did find out who might still have versions of this treatment out there and who might still be providing it to people and more about those people. So it was very important for me to not like completely do the typical narrative podcast thing of, you know, there's no answer. It's the lesson along the way type of thing, which is, I get it because it's, it's so many, for so many stories, there's not going to be closure. There's not going to be this feeling of an end, but I don't know. I guess that, that you can do that with anything. And the point of that ending to me was like, it's the really compelling thing about rumors and, and uh, conspiracy theories or like folklore or whatever. It's like, you can go on and on and on and drive yourself mad. And I think a lot of people, especially with this case, who were involved with it, who believed in it, or who didn't believe in it, who wanted to prove it wrong. It's just, it's just one of those stories where you can, you can just, you can go insane just thinking about the possibilities. And I certainly did, <laughs> you know, I, I got lured into this loop and, and it made me understand more the people who wouldn't talk to me because, you know, they, at some point they just decided to let it go. And, and, you know, that's probably the wise thing to do with a lot of things but <laughs> i don't know uh when the series was published did you get any sort of negative feedback from anyone like you shouldn't be telling this story or anything like that a lot less than i than i thought we would i was really prepared for that type of reaction um, which i understand the hesitation i mean it is the age crisis is an obviously extremely serious thing and people lived through it and are still kind of traumatized by by what they went through during that time and to kind of tell that story with that in mind i knew it was going to be a little bit of a high wire act to to not go too far to completely alienate folks who you know are offended by by the idea that there are things that we weren't told about the crisis or that you know, the potential for someone to take this story and extrapolate from it and potentially do something detrimental to their own health because they believe in something that isn't proven. I totally get that. But I think we went in to tell this story with, we went in with that in mind. And while, while we did get a few, you know, tweets about, you know, that this is ridiculous, why would you tell this story? And I understand that opinion, but I think the story's more than just about the alleged cure or the the treatment. It's about how people react to crisis. It's about how it's about this complicated dynamic of you know a black physician who, at least it appears, wasn't treated fairly by white establishment, medical establishment figures. 
And it's about, it's about this trust in the government and, I, and, and the kind of medical establishment, which I think we all can understand, unfortunately, now going through the pandemic and everything. So I, I, I take that criticism very, very seriously, and I, and I don't want to make light of it. But, I, but ultimately, I think it was an important story. And I think we trusted that an audience would get what we were doing rather than like so doubt we were trying to, I think, shed light on this corner of the world and this corner of, or this perspective rather. And I think many of the people that we talked to for this story got that. And I think, and I, hopefully that comes through in the podcast, but you know, actually the feedback has been relatively positive. So I'm, I'm really grateful for that. As someone who is not a conspiracy theorist at all, listening to Serum, I was definitely more open to, hmm, you know, maybe there is something to this, you know, and I shared, I shared that I was listening to this series with a friend of mine who, who definitely is on the other side of that spectrum. <laughs> and he's like, what you mean? Anthony Fauci and the NIH are, you know, up to no good and they're corrupt. Like, of yeah. course they are. <laughs> yeah. Which is, which is funny because before I did this, like, I felt like I was almost going into, I started the project almost like trying to debunk what I was told in the cat. Oh, mm. what if I could debunk it? Which is such, I mean, that there's a lot of problems with that sure. perspective. Sure, sure, sure. And I think I, I learned a lot and my perspective changed throughout the reporting process, which maybe comes through in the podcast. But I think going through that journey from being on the one side of that, no, like conspiracy theories are all you know, BS, like it's all a coping mechanism or something like that, or it's all wild to like, what, what is that journey like to then teeter on the edge of the other side and see that other side? And maybe if you're on the other side, pull yourself in a little bit towards not everything is a conspiracy theorist. Sometimes, you know, there are other issues that are going on that aren't like the most wild kind of explanation. So I really wanted to try to bring both of those sides a little bit closer to one another to create some sort of understanding. I, I, I don't know if it worked, but that's just definitely what I was experiencing as I was reporting on the project. Let's pivot to the trailer. We are, this is the Trailer Park Podcast. So how important was it to have a compelling trailer for the series? I thought it was everything because we were just kind of coming out of nowhere. We had no history as a podcast. I mean, it was nice to lean on WHRY's kind of credibility and their their amazing journalism and, and as well as the polls. They they've been doing this for I think 10 years now. So which I'm now I'm now a reporter at the poll. So I guess I should say we, but I just joined. So I don't I'm still gonna say they. But we could lean on that credibility, but it was very important for us to come up really from the get go try to promise a lot in this series. I mean, that's why I, I listened to the episode featuring Serum, obviously. And uh, yeah, I, one of you guys said, yeah, we're not going to tell you the length of the trailer because we didn't <laughs> want to dissuade you <laughs> right, from listening, right, right. which I totally get. And, and it was a long trailer, but I really wanted to try to hit on each element so that each, each element, by that I mean each corner of the story, like the FBI, the CIA, the, you know, Anthony Fauci, the, the different kind of things that make up my skepticism at the beginning. We really wanted to try to promise all those dynamic little, little, I guess, appetizers so that you were hit with a sound collage of questions that you needed to go to the series just to understand what the series was about. You know what I mean? I, I felt like we wanted to go so broad with it where you were like, I don't get what this, well, I don't get what this is, but in a, in a positive way which I guess is maybe not the uh, ideal form of a trailer where you're supposed to explain what it is so that it entices people. <laughs> we kind of wanted to invert it, I guess, and just be like, uh, just leave, leave the listener with more questions than answers. So it was important. I, I don't know if it was successful, but, but I certainly, we certainly thought about it a lot. Even as we were writing the scripts, we were like, we got to put this in the trailer. We got to put that element in the trailer. And making notes of what what sound bites might work because we knew that 
a lot was riding on it for listenership because we just didn't have any prior history. So a question came to mind about just metrics in general. Do you know how well the, the series as far as I think, gosh, did I, I don't know if I looked this up on Chartable or not, but how were downloads, how were like that stuff? If you don't want to talk about that, that's fine. But I just thought I'd ask. I don't have a problem talking about it. I don't know if the station has a problem with it. So I'm going to, I'm going to be more conservative about sure, sure, uh, sure, sure. the answers that I give just because I don't know what the, you know, protocol is there. But I will say, you know, as far as I'm, I'm aware, I think we are the station's most successful limited run series, which is, which I'm really proud of. And we have, we have gotten more downloads than I think a lot of people expected us to especially because we didn't put any as far as i'm aware any money in in advertising the thing so because of that i'm really proud of of the amount of downloads that we got do i think we could have had more you can always have more right Um, exactly but i think as far as i'm aware it's been successful Re- relatively successful. It's not, you know, we, we created cereal or whatever, but it's been relatively <laughs> successful. <laughs> Fantastic. I want to ask you two more questions. So one about uh, any tips for podcasters who want to break into the narrative podcast space. And then the next question is about music. I totally forgot to add music in here because you created some of the music. You wrote some of the music, right? Yeah. Yeah. So a few songs I worked with a buddy of mine, Brandon Tomei, who's a really talented musician. And then uh, as any person who, who makes podcasts know, you always need more music than you think you're going to need. So when we were kind of in the middle of producing a lot of this stuff, we just realized we need a lot more music and a variety of it. So I, I basically just used Logic and, and, and my, my keyboard to come up with stuff on the fly as we were, as we were making it, which... I actually really enjoyed that part of the process. I think to be able to like make music specifically for a scene or specifically for a vibe like that you can tweak in real time was so fun. It was one of the most enjoyable parts of making the podcast was being able to kind of, you know, craft that that vibe in real time. So that yeah, I I love that. As a musician, I appreciated the music and the themes that went along throughout the whole series. I thought it was brilliant. And especially the, the music in the trailer really grabs. And, you know, it is, it, it is the central theme throughout all the episodes. But well done. Well done. Thanks so much. I, I appreciate that. I was really hoping that people would like the music because I spent way too much time thinking <laughs> about it. <laughs> and to everyone else on the projects, uh, you know, I guess detriment so i'm sorry to them but yeah i appreciate i appreciate the kind words yeah no problem all right so any tips for podcasters who you know want to break in a narrative and and maybe just feel like i don't know they can't any words of wisdom i think it just comes down to the story i got really lucky with this story which which is that from the get-go i i had no idea what the story was about and i still don't know what the fundamental kind of I don't know the fundamental answer to the answer to the questions presented in this story which you would say oh well that you know maybe that's maybe that's a flaw and maybe it is at the beginning of many podcasts the hosts will say this is a story about and then they give you like three themes of what the story is going to be about and I just think don't you want the listener to like in a movie you, you wouldn't hear somebody directly to the camera say to the camera you know this movie is about love and hardship or whatever it's you know part of the fun of going of listening to a story is figuring out what it's about yourself and and what it means to you and so i think for anybody who wants to break into narrative podcasts it's really fundamentally about the story you can have the best equipment in the world but if you know what the story is about 5 minutes after you start become really interested in it I don't, I don't know if it's going to carry the amount of episodes that you're going to want to produce about. And so I think that's just what I've learned is like, because I've had other ideas before 
for stories. And then after doing this, I realized, man, I'm so glad I didn't make that because it would have just, it's just not enough. You know, there's just not enough there to not enough mystery. You're just going to need a big story to carry all the episodes, I think. And the other tip is just, I don't know. Don't be scared to do it. It's like dipping your, your toe into, into like water and you've never swam before. Like you get in and, and you get a little more comfortable and then you get in a little bit. And like each time you talk to somebody new about this, whatever the thing you're doing, the podcast is about, you start to really think to yourself, oh, I'm actually really doing this. I'm actually making this podcast, I guess. <laughs> and then you talk to the number amount, you talk to amount like 10 people and you're like, well, I guess I have to make it now because 10 people know that like I've talked to 10 people. And they now expect me to make something out of this. So kind of lock yourself in, you know, right, right, right. <laughs> and then, and then you have no choice but to make it. And that's, yeah, you know, mostly a good thing. <laughs> I don't know if that's a helpful tip or not, but, but no, that's great. That's great. Grant Hill, thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate you and your work on Serum. Thanks so much, Tim. And I'm a big fan of, of the Trailer Park podcast. So thank you so much for having me on. Thanks for spending some time at the park. I hope that this episode demystified the concept of narrative, deeply investigative podcasts for you just a bit. We'd love to know your takeaways. Ariel and I will be back in your feed before you know it. Love this episode or TPP in general and want to get in touch? Email us at hello at trailerparkpod.com. Are you a creator? Submit your trailer by going to trailerparkpodcast.crd.co. Ariel and I are going through trailers right now for season two, and we may just pick yours. Find us on Instagram and tag us in your favorite trailers. We're at trailerpark underscore pod. Happy trails! Happy trails!